Greeting Earthlings, if you follow the channel, you know that I just finished building a driver for an electromechanical Soyuz space clock. The clock belongs to famous investor and space collector Steve Jurvetson. Steve had loaned us quite a few items, the space clock, a Titan missile guidance computer, and a core memory module from the Saturn V guidance computer. And it is high time we return them and tell him what we found about them. Ken, Carl, Mike and I went together for this much anticipated visit. No way. The ever enthusiastic Steve was ecstatic over my mother's little box. I can hardly imagine what he says when Elon shows him his latest rocket. We turned the clock on with the expected result that it soon drove the other office people crazy. But for us space nerds, we heard nothing but music. It was then Ken's turn to bring back the Titan missile guidance computer. Ken did most of the detective work on this one and has written an in-depth article about his findings, which I'll link in the description. When it first came to us, it had never been open and was basically a big and very heavy black lump of metal. It's, it's very heavy, you'd think they make it light, but man. Yeah, look, look at the thickness of the, the metal here. It's super thick. And uh, was it still sealed when you got it? Um, yeah, I vented out the nitrogen, um, which is probably a good thing Steve mentioned it, because otherwise there's like, you know, 500 pounds of force ah, when I unscrew it. Yeah, so. not good. When Ken brought it to my lab, he had already opened it and removed most of the cards, but had not yet succeeded to remove the core memory cards. And here it is, fully repopulated. Ken wrote a detailed article about it, which I will link in the description. This computer was first used in the guidance system of the Titan III satellite launch rockets, and later retrofitted in the Titan II missiles. The Titans were powerful rockets, and Titan II is better known as the launch vehicle for the Gemini missions. The Titan III launched the Viking probes to Mars and the two Voyager solar system exploration probes in the 1980s. The computer itself is a Magic 352 and was developed by Delco, a division of General Motors, in the early 1970s. Ken just extracted one of the logic cards, which contained surface-mounted TTL chips, on six-layer PCB boards. The computer has no microprocessor and is solely built out of medium integration scale TTL chips, very much like all mini computers were built in the 1970s. The other side has the interesting looking analog interface boards, which come in all sizes and shapes, mostly with transistors and mysterious circuits, including this handmarked module. But the most intriguing part was probably the 16 kW core memory module, which was stubbornly stuck inside the computer. We soon discovered the key to its removal. It involved voiding the warranty. Uh, it says that you're going to void the warranty on this thing? Yep, it says do not break seal, but Carl has discovered this hidden access panel, so... Which would explain why we, wouldn't be able, why we weren't able to take the memory stuff out. What what is the date on this uh, on this computer? So the, the parts are 78, 77, 79. And look what we found underneath this once we pried it off. It's just a seal plate and then the, here are the real screws. So no wonder we couldn't take the freaking module out. All right, it went much better once we removed the hidden extra screws. They really did not want this module to move during launch. Ooh, ah, looks promising. We disassemble further, is that the, the idea? All right. Oh, there's flex. There's flex circuitry in it, in 1978, my friends. Oh, I see the cores, right here. Oh, plates of cores. Mm -hmm. We took out a whole pile of screws to remove these brackets, and now the core memory opens like a book. Each board has a bunch of cores and then the support logic 
and then there's um, just bare wires and flex connectors between the, yeah, the a boards. 1978 flex circuit, that's pretty impressive. And you can read more about Ken's further findings in the linked article. Before we returned it, Ken made a nice plexiglass front window for it so we could display it properly, while we left the core memory proudly sitting on top. Oh, that's nice like this. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful. Isn't it a good, good display? Such a nice module. Next, we turned our attention to this holy piece of the Apollo Saturn V rocket that Steve had loaned to us. I present to you the LVDC Core Memory Module. LVDC stands for Launch Vehicle Digital Computer. In many previous videos, we had talked about the Apollo Guidance Computer, located in the command module and the LEM, but there was another independent guidance computer in the Apollo rocket of a completely different design. Let me explain, using another wonder of modern technology, the LEGO system. So previously we talked a lot about the Apollo guidance computer, uh, of which there are two, one located in the uh, common module and the other one located in the LEM, which during launch is under the shroud here. But there was a third guidance computer uh, for the uh, Saturn V uh, launch vehicle called the LVDC Launch Vehicle Digital Computer. And it was located in this black ring here called the Instrument Unit at the very top of the uh, rocket. And its function was to guide uh, the rocket itself, the Saturn V. And of course it was all at the top because as you were staging down, you want to keep it with you. As the rocket stages, uh, which this incredible Lego model does too. Uh, you keep it with you, right? You are just with the uh, Saturn 4B stage. You keep it until a uh, lunar insertion, uh, and then a, uh, after that burn is completed, uh, the, let's see if I can do it without breaking things, the, uh, that has been gone a long time ago, the CSM separates, and then we'll come and pick up the LEM and then they rely on their uh, the Apollo Gainos computer. But all the asset uh, was relying on the LVDC uh, with a possible um, backup. It could be taken uh, over by the AGC, but actually that never happened uh, in a real flight. And by the way, while we are talking about awesome Lego models, that's their LEM model. Uh, so I, I, I don't have the real thing like Steve Jurvetson, but I have the Lego model, which is almost the same. And look, the, the ascent stage separates and they even have a brick for the AGC, which is exactly where it should be. So at the back, you have a little AGC brick. So the AGC was made out of Lego. I'm sure you didn't know that. But let's go back to our instrument ring, which was a ginormous thing. You might wonder what the technician is doing with his telescope in the corner. It's not a telescope, but most likely a laser, shining through a window on the side of the ring. This was used to align the inertial platform, or IMU, prior to launch. You can see the ball of the IMU on the other side of where he's shining his laser. There was a reference laser on the ground shining all the way up to the window at the top of the rocket on the launch pad, so the IMU was kept in alignment down to the last second before launch. Not far from the IMU are two large rectangular boxes. In yellow, you finally see the LVDC, the digital computer. And on top of it, in orange, its even larger companion, the LVDA, the Launch Vehicle Digital Adapter. That's the box that had the I.O. and the digital to analog circuits that interface the computer to the actual hardware on the rocket. The last piece of the computer system was the FCC, the big black cylinder which I have highlighted in the green box. FCC stands for Flight Control Computer. This so-called computer was actually an analog computer. It performed relatively simple signal processing, mostly analog computations and frequency filtering of the error signals calculated by the digital computer before they were applied to the engine gimbal servos. This was difficult to do with the digital electronics of the time, but mapped well to an analog computer based on operational amplifiers. So very much like the AGC, the LVDC got its primary orientation information from the IMU, interface to the engine gimbals, and was responsible for steering the rocket during ascent. Unlike the AGC, it didn't have an interface to the astronauts. 
Made by IBM, it was at the opposite end of design philosophies from the AGC. Whereas the MIT design AGC was all sheer brilliance and daring novelty, the IBM LVDC was the epitome of conservative design. Foremost, it was a triple redundant design, meaning every logic function was implemented in triplicate, and a voting circuit would choose the answer given by the majority of circuits. It was a 26-bit machine, but it used a serial design, meaning the LLU operated on one bit at a time to greatly simplify the hardware, and therefore it was very slow. IBM obviously prioritized reliability over performance. And in that it performed admirably, not skipping a beat when hit by lightning on Apollo 12's launch, correctly discarding the bad transient data, and dutifully continuing to steer the Saturn V to orbit. But as conservative as its architecture was, its hardware implementation was far from stodgy. It used IBM's miniature hybrid circuits instead of ICs and flat flex circuits for interconnects. These small metallic cans are not ICs, these are ULDs. They are little hybrid on ceramic modules with individual diode and transistor dies connected via traces and printed resistors. IBM was wary of the newfangled ICs which they considered unproven and unreliable and instead made their miniature circuits out of individual parts and relied on incredible micropackaging to achieve the required density. Here you can see the inside of a ULD. The top of the ceramic on the left has a few transistor and diode dies and the underside on the right has the printed resistors. The computer has the logic cards arrayed in the front and the memory modules are plugged at the back. Here is a period photo of the back of the unit with one memory module plugged in. And here is a picture of a unit with all of its eight memory modules plugged in. Each module had 8000 half words of core memory. The half words were 13 bits plus one parity bit for added reliability. So this translates roughly to a 12 kilobyte module in modern terms for a max of 96 kilobytes of computer memory. On an assembled module, you can see the core ferrite stack because it is covered on all sides by driver boards. But here I have a picture of what the core stack actually looks like in the middle. Can you spin it around because it's, this is very three dimensional. They have boards yeah, on the top. Exactly. Of I love that. Like, there's absolutely no homage to planar. You know, and it so hasn't fully sunk in yet. And so it's it's core memory. So you have your your tiny rings of of core that you magnetize, mm -hmm. and so you have an X Y grid to select which um, which core you want. And so on the one side you have your your X. I think that this is the, the X drivers. Okay. So you have um, 128 wires that go that go the one way through the cores, and then on this side you have the Y drivers. You've got 64 drivers, 64 wires that go through the other way. So the Y board gives you 64 lines, uh -huh. which you can see come, come along the the, um, the ribbon cable here. Mm -hmm. So so they go through this way. And since you've got 128 for the X, you need two boards. So that's why there's, there's two boards, boards here. Yep. And, and then you can see a huge stack of hundreds of diodes <laughs> in between. Oh yeah, this is actually amazing. Look at this manufacturing technique. So, so mm -hmm. the reason they have all these diodes is that for your 64 wires, you don't want to have 64 driver circuits. Okay. You can have like eight on one side and eight on the other side. This was a common trick used in core memory where you would minimize the number of drivers by grouping the wires in a multiplexed matrix arrangement at the expense of necessitating lots and lots of diodes. To save space for the many, many diodes, they mounted them vertically between two boards in a configuration known as cordwood construction. So instead of like a diode being on a circuit board, right, mm -hmm. like you'd expect, mm -hmm. they're literally running perpendicular between the boards. Oh, well, that's cool. Hundreds of them, right? Yeah. 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 So, 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 so th these chips are not integrated circuits. Oh, They're um, called ULD, unit, lo think unit logic device. And IBM didn't think integrated circuits were ready. So each one of these has like tiny transistor and, and diode dies. Discrete. Discrete. Mounted, mounted on ceramic and then thin, thin film resistors. 
These colorful boards on the top and bottom are the sense amplifier boards, the delicate amplifiers that read the faint signals from the cores, one for each bit in the word. So there are seven at the top and seven at the bottom for a total of 14 bits. Sense amplifiers are still needed to this day in modern DRAM memory, but you never ever see them beautiful like this. So these amplify the signals coming out, then those, then your 14 um, bit word goes to the computer, which then converts it to serial because the computer is running one bit at a time in serial. And the reason we could not uh, make it work and read it is that some of the circuits are broken or missing. And you can see this one is dislodged, this one is completely broken uh, and completely missing. This one is missing and the damage is even worse on the other side. And you can see how there is even more damage on this side. So here is a broken one, another broken one, some dislodged ones. Unfortunately to get to the core memory itself we could drive it on our own but uh, as you can tell it's all sealed uh, and uh, we couldn't remove the board without removing the ceiling and it's just not worth um, touching this, this uh, historical artifact uh, to read it because we would have only one eighth of the memory anyhow. We even considered reverse engineering the broken circuits from a non-broken one and rebuilding an equivalent. But even then, we would have only one chance at reading the module, because reading core memory is destructive, as I explained in my other video. I should be able to read that one. I read this one, and I destroyed it. It's gone. And since we don't have another module to try it on first, it is very unlikely we'd do it right the first time and then we would risk losing the whole content. Finally, even if we did that, we'd recover only one eighth of the code. And to make matter worse, the software is still ITAR classified since it could be used to steer nefarious missiles. So we would land in dangerous legal waters. So we won't, we won't read it, but we can still admire it. Okay, and this barely scratches the surface. This is where only the first three items we return. There is so much more to see. And then another crazy guest arrived. So I guess we will cover that in the next episode. See you then. I see. Whoa! It, um, <laughs> I had a rapid disassembly, but here's, okay, it didn't work as I wanted to.